thanks everyone for coming. I think we're going to get started. So we're here to talk about continuously deploying to Kubernetes with the Google Container Tool. So who's using Kubernetes here in the room? OK, cool. cool. Who's not using uh, Kubernetes, but is using Docker containers? Quite a few people. OK, cool. So before I start, let me introduce myself. So I'm David Gajot. I'm a developer advocate uh, on the Google Cloud Platform. I'm based out of Paris, France. And I, I love everything that's related to developer experience, uh, especially for everything that's related to containers. And I love cats. You can find me on Twitter, GitHub, Instagram. It's always the same uh, login, D-G-A-G-E-O-T. OK, so quite a few people here are using Kubernetes. What is it like to develop in a Kubernetes world? Do you like it? Yeah, <laughs> only a few people like it. <laughs> Do you hate it? Nobody hates it, OK. But because for me, like I'm used to develop on my machine, and I change something, and it's automatically refreshed in my favorite IDE. So I've got some kind of continuous uh, a cycle where I code, and I see the result, and I code, and I see the result. And as soon as you start with Kubernetes, and you try to develop something that's going to be deployed on Kubernetes, it's a little bit like that, right? <laughs> it's like, I've been told there's a lot of tools I can use, but there's like so many tools, so many layers, so many complexity. How do I handle it like when I'm developing, and how do I handle it when I'm deploying, uh, it's very complicated. Uh, most of the tools that exist are not completely finished. Most of them are quite, quite new. Uh, most of them don't really know what they should do to improve the life of developers or production. It's, it's a brand new world. It's really complicated. Um, and in fact, at Google, we ask our, user, our users, sorry, uh, what is it like to, to develop with Kubernetes? And this, they told us it was really frustrating. Uh, so much complexity, so much configuration. Who likes YAML files? YAML files? <laughs> Who doesn't like YAML files? OK. You can leave the room, because I'm sorry, you're going to have a lot of YAML files shown on the screen. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, you have to love YAML files. It's on your life. Uh, debugging is a pain. When you're a developer, you want to debug your application. Uh, it's, it's really a pain. Uh, applications have so many moving parts. I mean, it's not completely due to Kubernetes or containers. It's just that thanks to uh, Kube and containers, we are now able to split our applications into multiple pieces. And, and then it becomes uh, more complicated to, to understand the big picture, uh, understand to how to deploy all of them how to work on only one of them. It's really complicated. And basically, all the people want is spend much time on their, uh, more time on their code. They don't want to spend so much time trying to understand all the tools and layers. Just let me show you what is it like to develop a very, very simple Hello World application with Kubernetes. OK? Can you all, can you all see the screen? No? Like, OK, up this way, maybe. It's going to be better. Can you read everything on the, yeah, bit bigger? OK, it's going to be complicated then afterwards, after that. OK, so this is Go code, but it could be any language. And it's like the simplest code I could come up with to say hello world every second. And usually, when I develop this code, I do something like that. And I want to run it. I, do, I, I run go run, main.go, and boom, it runs. And I can change the code. I can run it again. It's very quick. I've got a very tight feedback loop. Okay. When I'm working with containers, I have to add another file, which is the Docker file. Every, everybody knows what a Docker file is. If you don't know what a Docker file is, it's just the recipe that Docker will follow to create a Docker image in which your application will run in a, in, inside a container. So basically here, what I'm saying is my application needs to be built before it can run, and I need to build it with Golang. So I'm going to copy the main.go, this one, into the container. I'm going to build it, and it's going to give me a binary that can run inside a container. So I can do something like Docker build. It's going to build 
my Docker image and Docker run, and it's going to run. It's the same Go application running inside a container. And then later on, I want to deploy it to Kubernetes. So I need to write another file. This time it's YAML, yeah. So this is the minimal YAML I could come up with to run that single container on a cluster. It's, it's running inside a pod, and I can give it the name of the image I just built, and it's going to run it uh, on, on Kubernetes. So all I have to do is use the kubectl uh, command line to talk to Kubernetes. I, got, I need to send it the pod.yaml, and it, told, it tells me that it's created. OK. Uh, what else can I, can I do? I can say I can see that it's running, and I can see the logs for it. OK. It's doing what I thought it should do, OK? Quite simple. I went from local development to deploying to Kubernetes very easily. But then, then the real life of a developer is that I'm going to change that code a lot. So let's do that. I'm going to change the code. And I'm going to say, hello, DevOps. And I need to rebuild the Docker image. I'm going to give it a new version tag. V2. This time it's a bit longer. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit the pod.yaml to change the version. I'm going to remove the sound. And I'm going to apply again that YAML. And to make sure that what I changed was actually deployed, I need to see the logs. And it's deployed. All those comments, you have to type them in the right order, OK? You have to rebuild, put a new tag, change your, all your YAMLs that are referencing this image. You've got to send it. It's, it's very long. And you might, you might argue that you're not going to deploy a lot on Kubernetes. But in fact, the more you're going to use Kubernetes, the more you're going to want to deploy on it. Because Kubernetes is, is a platform on top of which people are going to be add more and more layers that are going to add more and more value to, to your applications. And so that you don't put all the complexity inside your code, but you put the, code, the complexity on the platform, in the platform. So when lots of the features are in the platform, you're going to have to deploy very, very often to Kubernetes to make sure that what you've deployed, what you've developed locally uh, actually works. Right? So this is what I call the, the infinite loop of pain and suffering. It's going to be your daily life if you're developed to Kubernetes. You're going to change code, rebuild your images. You're going to push those images to a registry. You're going to patch all your YAMLs, kubectl again, kubectl apply again. And then you have to verify that what you've sent to Kubernetes is actually what you meant, and that it is actually working. It's very error prone, because you can make a mistake at every step, you can forget a command. And people usually solve that by writing their own bash script or make files. I don't know who wrote bash script or make files for that. Quite a few people. Uh, the problem with that is that you can put bugs in those scripts. And also, each time you change team, you have to learn the new tools. Okay. So this is where scaffold enters. Who knows scaffold? Nobody? Cool. So you're going you're gonna to discover Scaffold. Scaffold is a CLI tool that you can install on your machine or you can install on your CI CD. That gives you iterative development for Kubernetes. And it works with local clusters or remote clusters. In fact, it works with any Kubernetes. And it will give you a very tight uh, feedback loop. It's open source. You can find it on GitHub, Google Container Tools, slash uh, Scaffold. Let me show you how Scaffold works. So here I've got the same sources as before. Um, OK, so I've got a main.go, I've got a Docker file, and I've got the Kubernetes manifest. And I want to use Scaffold to do exactly what I showed you. So first, I need to write an additional YAML file. Yeah, YAML file, I told you. But maybe you don't have to write it, because Scaffold comes with an init command that can do the work for you. So basically, it's going to introspect all your, it's going to list your files, and it's going to try to find the Docker files and the YAML files, and it's going to try to match one with the other. So with this sample, it's quite easy because I've got only one Docker file and one YAML file. So scaffold in it will give me this configuration. Okay, I'm going to build one artifact. It's going to be named with this image name, 
which is the one, the tool found in the pod YAML. Do you want to use that one? Yes. OK. So now I've got scaffold configured. I can do things like scaffold build. Not very impressing, impressive. It's going to just build my artifact or all the artifacts I listed in the scaffold YAML. OK. It's just that there is a, a very smart uh, cache mechanism so that if you try to rebuild something from the same sources, it's going to be very quick, even quicker than what Docker build would give you. Uh, but it's not really impressive. What you can do also is you can run scaffold run. Scaffold run will basically take your sources, uh, build them to an image, tag the image, uh, change the YAML files, send them to Kubernetes, and we tell you that it's configured. So for example, here the, the tool chooses an, uh, an image uh, tag automatically without, without you doing it. You, you don't have to think anymore about tags. It's going to use your git tags or git commits to tag your images. But it's not really impressive. Uh, you can also run scaffold run dash dash tail. And this one is quite nice because it's basically the whole loop. It's you change something and then you run scaffold run dash dash tail and it's going to rebuild, tag, change the YAML, push to Kubernetes, and show you the logs so that you know what was deployed. Do you like that? Yeah, but it could, I can do better. I can do better. I can do better than. Yeah. So you're developers, so you might want to take a look at scaffold dev. Scaffold dev does exactly the same, but in addition, it's going to watch for your file changes, so that each time you f change files f from your IDE, it's going to find which images should be rebuilt. It's going to rebuild them. It's going to tag them automatically. It's going to take that time, put it in the YAML and send it to Kubernetes. Let me show that to you. I'm going to open a new tab, and I'm going to change the code. So when I save, Scaffold will detect the change, will automatically rebuild the image, will automatically tag, and send it to Kubernetes and show you the logs. So you can run that in the background, and you've got your application continuously deployed to a local or remote Kubernetes, and you can just focus on your code. Who likes that? Want, want to use that? OK. You should try it on Monday. I always say you should try it on Monday. Like Monday, you're going to be back to work, and you're going to want to try something new, something you, show, you saw at the, the conference. So yeah, it's going to be very smart. So if you change something, it's going to build, rebuild only the images that should be rebuilt. It's going to retag only those images, et cetera, et cetera. OK. But there's one problem. So I showed you. I changed a small Go application, and it was very quick to rebuild the image. But in reality, it can take a long, a long time to rebuild your images. Who's using Java here or any JVM-based language? OK. So this is like a sample Hello World using Spring Boot. It's like the most simple application you can write with Spring Boot. And there's the POM XML here. And usually, you'd build it with a Maven package. OK? Quite quick, like a few seconds, like less than two seconds. OK? Um, if I change something, well, I'm not going to show that. OK, and then I want to containerize it. So I want to run it inside Docker to deploy it to Kubernetes. So this is the kind of Docker file I would have to write. So already, this is quite complicated. This is quite complicated to come up with that Docker file. The Docker file is, is optimized to make sure that I've got a, a very tight feedback loop. I, I'm going to show show you the result. But I'm going to first show you how you'd build your image. So you'd build your image like that. OK? It's very quick, because I just built it before the presentation on my machine. But now, let's say I want to change something in this pom.yaml. I'm going to change something that has zero impact on my application. I'm going to add exclamation marks. Okay. How long do you think the Docker build will take if I press Enter? Ten seconds. Ten seconds? Who said more? Who says more? Hmm? 30, seconds. 30 seconds? More. <laughs> going to show that to you. OK. What it's going to do, I change a comment okay, that has zero impact on my application. But because, because the build is running inside Docker with Docker build, it's going to take maybe four minutes, depending on the Wi-Fi. OK? The reason why is that I changed this file here. So all the things that Docker has done 
after that file was imported into my image has to be done again. And this command will download all the plugins, all the dependencies for your application. I didn't change the, the source code. I changed only a comment in the POM YAML. But Docker has no idea what a, Docker, what a POM YAML is. It has no idea what Maven is. It has no idea what could be the impact of adding this comment. So it has to do all the steps over and over again. Okay? If I change only something in the sources, because of the way my Docker file is created, it would be a bit faster because it wouldn't have to redownload all the plugins. It would just recompile the whole application as if it, has, it had never seen this application before. But yeah, I said four minutes, but I think it could be longer than that. The Wi-Fi is not very snappy, okay? So this is a problem. I showed you scaffold dev, which seems magical, and then you have a hello world in Java, and you have to wait 10 minutes for it to be rebuilt. So what can you do? Basically, with Docker build, you cannot do anything. There's no solution to that if you use Docker build. One of the possible solutions is to use another uh, open source project that's called Jib. Who knows Jib here? A few people? OK. Uh, so Jib is for Java Image Builder. It's a set of plugins for Maven and Gradle that you can use to build Docker images for your JVM applications without installing Docker on your machine or on your CI CD, without even writing a Docker file. Okay? Remember that Docker file that was complicated? You don't have to learn it. You don't have to write it. And it will give you very incremental builds. I'm going to show that to you. So it's the same application here. It's just that I added a single plugin here. I added the Jib Maven plugin at the bottom. Sorry, it's at the bottom of the screen. And with that plugin now, I can do something like Maven compile Jib build, and it's going to automatically compile the application, and then produce a Docker image, and push it to a registry. All that in five seconds. OK? So I didn't write any Docker file. I didn't have to install Docker on my machine. It's, do it, it's doing it everything in pure Java. Because in fact, Java can build a Docker image. A Docker image is just a, an archive with files and JSON files and more archives inside that describes all the layers of a Docker image. You can use any language to create a Docker image. So Java, uh, Jib is using Java to create a Docker image. So it's going to build the application on your machine, not inside a container, and then the result will be imported inside an image that's going to be pushed to registry. And what happens if I change like a single comment? And I do the same command again. It's going to be, again, a few, sec a few seconds, like four seconds. OK? So if I use that with scaffold, I should be able to keep my tight feedback loop. OK? And also, everything is going to be much faster. Like locally, on my CI CD, it's going to be much faster. And if you want to use Jib with scaffold, you can use the same scaffold YAML that I generated before. And you just have to change the type of the artifact and say, hey, I'm going to use Jib Maven to build artifacts, so that if you do something like scaffold uh, build, it's going gonna, it's gonna to use Jib to build that image, OK? Who wants to try Jib? Only a few people? Oh, you should really try it. Like, it w it w if you do like Java, Kotlin, Groovy, whatever, uh, as long as you use Gradle or Maven. And I think there's also a plugin for SBT if you're doing Scala. So you should really try Jib. It's something that you can also install on your CI CD to deploy your applications to production. By the way, with scaffold, if I do scaffold build again, it's going to be very quick. Yeah. One second. Uh, yeah, same with Gradle. Just have to, to add the plugin here. I'm not going to show you how it works. OK, but all those samples I showed you are simple hello worlds, OK? I want to show you that it works very well also with a bigger application. I mean, it's not a big application. It's just an application that's composed of multiple microservices. Here I've got six microservices, I think. Yeah, there's some Golang. There's some Java built with Gradle. There's some Node.js, static website. There's a PostgreSQL database. And quite a few YAML files. Yeah, you love YAMLs, right? So I'm going to show all of them to you. 
So in your scaffold YAML, you just have to list all your artifacts. And with a single command, scaffold dev, it's going to talk to your Kubernetes cluster. It's going to rebuild all the images, tag all of them, send them, and show you the logs for all the services so that when your application is deployed, you can see the logs. See? I refresh. I should, it should work. It's not. OK, I broke something. No worries. I'm going to do that. So I changed, I changed my presentation to two days ago, and I broke it. So I broke the refresh button. Thank you, David. So yeah, it works. OK, and if I go back to the, the source, the, oops, I can see the logs. OK, so this is very convenient when you have multiple services and you deploy them to Kubernetes to see all the aggregated logs in the same place. It's very hard to do with Kubernetes, strangely. And I'm going to change now. I'm going to change um, something. So I'm going to change, say, uh, the title component that's written in Java. And I'm going to change uh, here. I'm going to say for DevOps. And I'm going to write it. And Scaffold will automatically re detect the changes, rebuild only that artifact, and redeploy that artifact so that my application here, if I refresh it, boom, it's already deployed. Okay. So you've got this tight feedback loop. You continuously deploy to Kubernetes. Okay. Uh, it can be even faster if you change something that's only a static file. I'm going to change the static file here, and I'm going to add more question marks because question marks is very important. Okay. I'm going to save it. It's going to be very quick. So what happened here is that Scaffold detected the change, and instead of rebuilding the Docker image for you, it's going to just send the, ch the file that were changed to your remote cluster inside the pod, inside the container at the right place. And because I've got uh, some kind of, hot, uh, some kind of uh, live reload set up on my Node uh, application, it was auto-reloaded. I'm going to do that again. Yeah, I've got a question. Does it create a new Docker layer, or does it change the file? So, so this, is, this is only for development. It just changes the file. OK, so your Docker image is running inside a pod, inside a container, and it's going to connect to the pod. It's going to just replace the file with a new one. It's like PHP at the time, you know, where we are. We were just deploying to production like that. So it's basically what it does. I want to show you that it works also with a remote cluster. So for my demonstration, I used a Docker desktop. Who knows Docker desktop here? So Docker desktop is uh, the easiest way for you to install Docker on your Mac or Windows, but also the easiest way to run a Kubernetes single node cluster on your Mac or Windows machine. You just have to tick that box, and boom, you've got Kubernetes running on your machine that you can connect to, and you can uh, see the application on localhost. Uh, but I'm going to connect now to a remote cluster. I'm going to use another tool that's quite nice, kubecontext, and I'm going to co connect to a cluster that's running on Google Cloud, and just to show you that it's a bigger cluster with more than one node, uh, there's three nodes. And I'm going to run the exact same command, scaffold dev. So this time, it's a bit longer. It takes a bit longer because this cluster is remote. It has to make sure that all the images are pushed to a registry for the cluster to pull them. Okay? I cannot work like only uh, locally, but still, Scaffold tries to make it uh, as quick as possible by maintaining a cache of the images that it has pushed already. So very quickly, your application is deployed, and we should see the logs. I'm going to connect also on localhost, which is strange because my cluster is remote. But I don't want, as a developer, to think about the IP address of my cluster. I just want to connect to the same URL, no matter if it's a local cluster or a remote cluster. And Scaffold will do some kind of port forwarding for me so that I can just connect on localhost uh, reload. OK? So the application is here. OK? So this is on a remote cluster. I can add some more question marks, because we never have enough. And it's going to do the same kind of magic. Or not. Yes. Yeah. yeah. OK. So. Basically, I'm working with a remote cluster, and 
I've got the same experience than with a local cluster. So let's say my application is becoming too big for me to, deploy, to, to work on it locally. I can start using a remote cluster. Maybe that is shared between users. Maybe I've got a namespace for me, and I can just focus on my code and do my things, and it's going to be automatically redeployed to Kubernetes. Who wants to, who likes that? Yeah, cool. And when you control C, everything will be cleaned up so that you, you keep your cluster uh, clean. Uh, there should be an image here. It's gone. OK. So, thank you. <laughs> uh, that was Scaffold and Jib. So Scaffold gives you a tight feedback loop. It will adapt to your tooling. So here, it used Docker build to build some of our images. It used Jib to build other images. Uh, it could also use Bazel, which is a tool developed by Google, and that's now open source. That's uh, the copy of the tool we are using internally. Uh, for deploying your application, it can use kubectl, but it can also use Helm. Who's, who's using Helm here? OK, so if you like Helm, you have Helm templates, and Scaffold can use them to deploy your applications. Basically, it's going to try to adapt to the tools you already like. It's going to just connect the dots between those tools, and it's going to give you a very nice uh, continuous deployment loop. OK, can it be easier than that? Would you like it to be even easier? No? Easier? A bit? Yeah? Too complicated already? So <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you uh, Cloud Code. Who knows Cloud Code? Oh, cool. So Cloud Code uh, is a set of plugins for your favorite IDE, uh, if your IDE is IntelliJ or uh, Visual Studio Code. And <laughs> And it gives you a very strong, like, integrated experience with a very tight feedback loop. And it's, it tries to help you with all, those, all this Kubernetes complexity. So I'm going to show you how it works. So here, I'm using Visual Studio Code. I'm sure it's not, I mean, who's using Visual Studio Code here? A few people, OK. So I thought uh, IntelliJ, OK, cool, Eclipse. Afraid to, oh, only one person, so sorry. <laughs> sorry, it turns out we choose uh, the right IDs. I don't know, <laughs> strange. Um, so this is Visual Studio Code. Uh, this is my uh, hexagon application with all my microservices. You can see the scaffold YAML here. You've got the sources for all the components. And if I use the, the palette here and I can type Cloud Code, I can see what Cloud Code can do for me. Cloud Code, for example, if I'm, a, uh, if I'm just getting started with Kubernetes, can help me create new applications from scratch. I can choose to create a Python application, or Go, or Node.js, or Java, or .NET Core, and it will help me get started with Kubernetes. Okay, so this is really nice for people just getting started. Also, it's going to give me like it's going to give me all the tooltips tool documentation I need. In, uh, on my YAML files, because YAML files are complicated, uh, so I want as many help as I can have. Okay? It's going to give me also some kind of uh, validation. This should be an uh, integer, so okay, some kind of validation. Uh, I think there's some kind of uh, yeah, up completion also. So I can say, OK, I can see the different types of uh, services, things like that. So it's very useful as a developer to get some help from my IDE. Uh, but also, what Cloud Code is going to give me is going to give me the continuous deployment that I showed you, but inside my IDE. So I can just continuously deploy to Docker Desktop, for example. And it's going to run scaffold in the background. It's going to build all my components. And it's going to show me uh, the logs for all those components. And it's going to tell me when the application is ready to be used. And of course, if I change something inside my IDE, more question marks, uh, exclamation marks, sorry, it's going to sync them. And boom, my application is updated. Okay? So here, I'm inside my IDE. I've got this tight feedback loop. I don't have to think about scaffold. I don't have to open a terminal. I don't have to think about it. I just focus on my code, OK? Who wants to try that? A few people, yeah. So you, uh, you can find 
the VS Code plugin in the VS Code marketplace and the IntelliJ plugin in the JetBrains plugin repository. Uh, both of those tools are not open source. They are using lots of open source components like scaffold and, and things like that. But it's not open source. We're trying to make sure we move as quickly as possible to make a product that brings a lot of value to our users. Uh, you should really try them and, and, and share your feedback on GitHub because all the issues are tracked uh, publicly on GitHub. So you should really try it. Um, OK. So let's go back to building Docker images. I showed you a tool to build your images quicker, with, that is Jib. But uh, building Docker images, it's still very hard. You're going to end up with images that are not secure, that have a lot of layers that are too big to push, too big to pull from your Kubernetes nodes. Uh, you have to, to ask yourself, which base image am I going to use? Uh, it's, it can be very complicated. So one tool you can use that's not a, an open source, it's not a Google open source tool, it's just the multi-stage build. Who knows multi-stage multi build in Docker? So most of the time, people are using Docker they are even writing Docker files sometimes, but they don't know multi-stage builds. So I really want to show you that. It's been there in Docker for multiple years, I don't know, yeah. And it's very useful. Uh, the idea is that your Docker file is going to be decomposed in multiple steps. So you're going to have each step will have a name, like this one is named Builder. And this step will only be used to build my application. And the result will be copied inside another step that is going to be used to run my application. So I take the sources, I copy them inside one step, it runs go build, the result is an application that's copied inside a smaller image with a different base image, and this one is going to go to production. And it's going to be much smaller. The idea is that all the tools I need to build my application, I don't need them in production. And even, even more, it's not secure to include them in my Docker images in production. So if I remove them, my images would be more secure and would be smaller. And it's very convenient to use multi-stage build for that. So one step to build, one step to run. You can have as many steps as you want. And it gives you a lot of flexibility on the base images you can use, OK? For Java, you would use the JDK here and only the runtime here, like to have a smaller image, for example. For Golang, it's, it's like this image contains the Go compiler, but also a C compiler, make files, Git, whatever. You don't need that in production. You only need your application and a very small base image. Talking about small base images, I want to tell you about DistroLess. So DistroLess is a set of minimal base images that are more secure and that you can use to, as base images for your, your uh, production workload. Uh, those images that do not contain a shell, that do not contain package managers, it's really minimalistic, OK? The idea is that. We tried to learn from what we're doing in production at Google with containers, and we tried to come up with a set of base images that you can use to produce your uh, production workload. And so you might want to use a Debian or Ubuntu as base image, but those images are too big. They contain too many things, and it's not really secure. Uh, you can use also an Alpine image, which is very small, but uh, it's using a different uh, uh, C library, libc. Uh, it's, it's not really uh, always convenient. So distress is here to help. I'm going to show you how to use distress. And it turns out it's quite easy. I'm going to show you first with a Go application and then with a, a Java application. So this is my usual main.go um, application. And and there's a Docker file here, and it's quite simple. It's the multi-stage build I showed you. I'm going to just change it, and I'm going to replace this image that's the one used to run by this one, gcrio distroless slash base. It's the smallest distroless image you can use. And I'm just going to paste that here, and I'm going to Docker build, and boom, I'm using distroless. But this time, 
the image I'm going to send in production is very minimalistic. There's no shell, there's no package manager. If someone enters into my image, there's only a few things they can do. Okay? It contains the libc, all the things that you need to do some kind of SSL certificate, and there's a root user, and that's basically it. For Java, it's the same, but we have a different Java image. We have a Java a GCRIO distro as Java. We have one for Java 8 and one for Java 11, I think. And if you open your Docker file, you can just replace that image, which is quite good, by another one, which is good also. And you can Docker build. And oh, okay, it was built already on my machine. Uh, and and your application basically is running the same way as before. It's a JVM official one. It's an Open JDK uh, 11. But the base image it's patched by Google. It's produced to be as secure as possible, and it's using. Um, I mean, there's no shell. There's no package manager. You, you can. There's only a few things you can do if you manage to enter into the image in production. Who's using DistroLess here? Nobody? OK. So if you're using Google Cloud, you might be using DistroLess without knowing it. We have some products that use DistroLess as base images. You just provide your code. We build it. We put it on top of DistroLess, and we put that in production. Uh, on App Engine, I think we do that. Uh, on Cloud Functions, maybe, too. So you might be using DistroLess without knowing it. That's DistroS. So it's a curated and secure set of base images. Uh, it's very easy to adopt with multi-stage bit. I, I, I usually joke about that, because when I talk to people who are getting started with Docker and Kubernetes, there is an architecture, uh, there is an architect uh, team that usually takes six months to find the right set of base images, right? Who's seen that already? Maybe not six months, maybe three months. I don't know. But usually they come up with a list of images, and you have to use them, but they're not good. With multi-stage build, you get some more flexibility. You can choose like any image you want to build your application, and maybe then you have to use the, 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 the fixed set of uh, images to, to, to run uh, your, your to actually run in production. It gives you more flexibility. You should really try DistroS. It's really, it really produces uh, very small uh, images. Actually, I can show you something, maybe. I'm going to show you, uh, yeah. What's the debug flavor? Yeah, so there's a debug flavor for those images if you really want to have a shell <coughs> in the image. It's very useful, like in pre-production, to enter the container and actually debug it. You don't want to do that in production, but in pre-prod, it's really useful to have a shell. In prod, it's useful, but you shouldn't do it. Uh, let me just maybe use another tool that's quite nice. Uh, let me just go back here. I'm going to show you uh, the result of a jib image, because jib by default is using distroless, which is quite nice. And I'm going to show you that. Uh, I'm going to build that jib image. And I'm going to use, uh, I need to be full screen, so I'm going to switch back to an actual Sorry. Zoom in. OK, so I'm going to do that again. Just to show you the layers of a Docker image. Sometimes we are told about layers, but we don't know what it is. So, come on. so the image name is here. If you want to learn about Docker images, you can use Dive. It's a very convenient tool that's going to show you all the layers for your images. And it's very convenient to see both the result of, of jib working and the result of, uh, the result of uh, distroless images. So here you can see on the left all the layers for my Docker image. And you can see that it's actually quite small ex except that layer. Guess what's in that layer? The JVM. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's big. It's bigger than my application. Okay, my application is. 2.8 kilobytes. It has 16 megabytes of dependencies, and it's using the JVM, which is 100 megabytes. And this is the base image. It's only less than 20 megabytes. Okay, this is a distroless image, 
and I can see the changes between each layers. So basically, there's a very small base image, and then there's the libc and things, I don't know what, maybe the certificate, and then there's the JVM. So you can see all the fonts and all the files that the JVM needs to work. And then you can see there's another layer here. I'm going to try to maybe close some of those and see if we see better. Yeah, you can see here, those are the dependencies of my Spring Boot application. Nice, 16 megabytes to run Hello World. Um, what is nice with Jib is that it will put all those dependencies in a separate layer so that if you change only the code, it will have in, an impact only on that last layer so that your images will be pushed and pulled very quickly. So if you're doing some kind of continuous deployment, it's going to be very quick. You don't have to push 16 megabytes each time you change only a comma in your code. In your code. I'm going to switch back to that layer. So that layer contains, uh, I guess, resources for my application. And this one is only the, the classes for my compiled application. Okay? So JIP does that kind of thing. And it combined with uh, DistroDS, it really gives you a very small uh, images that are very fast to push and pull. You should really try uh, Dive. It's really nice to understand the kind of things we're building. OK. I want to show you something that's really, really, really nice. It's called Canico. Who knows Canico? No? OK, that's cool. Nobody knows all the tools I'm talking about, so yeah. I'm going to change your life <laughs> a bit. Uh, so yeah, maybe you're not a developer, but maybe you are building images on a CI CD, and you are in charge of set setting up the CI CD. And maybe you know that you have two options to build Docker images on a Jenkins or any kind of CI-CD. You can either bind the Docker socket or do some kind of Docker in Docker. You don't have to know the details about those solutions because both solutions are bad. Okay? Both solutions are dangerous, and both solutions are not very efficient. So, but those are the two solutions we have, basically. If I have a Docker file, I've got my sources, and I need to build a Docker image, I need to run Docker build, I need to have my cluster set up with one of those two options. Uh, so it's tricky. And there's a, a tool called Canico. So Canico is basically a re-implementation of Docker build that recognizes the same Docker files, that produce, produces the same output, but that can run on any container or any Kubernetes cluster without you binding the Docker socket or doing some kind of crazy things. So you, it's, it's just going to, for example, if you run it in Kubernetes, it's just going to run inside a, Docker, uh, a pod, inside a container. It's going to grab the sources, grab the Docker file, do some kind of magic, produce a Docker image, and push it. And it's going to make it very easy for you to build your Docker images on any Kubernetes cluster. Let's say you have 20 services to build, and your machine is not strong enough, not quick enough to build all those services, you might want to offload that to a remote cluster. You just have to have a Kubernetes cluster and Canico, and you can build your Docker images on top of uh, uh, that cluster. No setup. I'm going to show that to you with Scaffold. So Scaffold, here I've got the image I want to build. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's a Canico. Uh, I'm going to use Canico to build that image. And I'm going to connect to a cluster like this one, remote cluster. It's the same cluster I used before with three nodes. And I'm going to use scaffold to build my components on that cluster. Not locally, not with Docker build. They're going to run, they're going to build uh, remotely. So let's do something like that. Scaffold build, same command. And it's going to take the sources locally. It's going to send them to a pod that's going to be started on Kubernetes. That pod will get the sources, get the Docker file, this Docker file. And it will produce a Docker image out of it, and it's going to push it directly to a registry. So it's going to take longer than when I do it on my machine. But if we have multiple users building images, like lots of images on a single cluster, it can build a lot of images in parallel. So it can be very, very efficient. This is not a good example of it being efficient, because it's, it, it's really long. Uh, we are still working on Canico to add some more caching mechanism, like more advanced caching. But it's really, really nice that you can take any Kubernetes cluster, like any, 
you can configure Scaffold, and Scaffold will talk to that cluster and build your images on top of it. You don't need to set up a very complicated CI CD system to do that. Okay? And it's secure. It's secure. You can do that on any Kubernetes cluster. You can do that also on Google Cloud Build. We support now either building with Docker Build or with Canico. Um, and I think Jenkins X is going to use uh, Canico now to build uh, the artifacts uh, instead of doing Docker Build. Because they have the same problem. They have to choose between binding the sockets or Docker and Docker. It's not secure. So I think they're going to use uh, Canico. Maybe they're doing it already. Somebody knows or no, nobody knows? I think they're gonna they're gonna do it very very uh, they're gonna do it in the uh, near future. Okay, one more thing I want to tell you is, okay, you've got a nice tight feedback loop in development. You can continuously deploy to Kubernetes while just focusing on your code, but then at some point you're gonna have to deploy to production. So of course you can use scaffold from your CI CD to build your application and deploy it to the cluster. I showed you how to use it on my local machine, but you can use it on Jenkins, you can use it on any Git, uh, GitLab CI, whatever, and you can use the same configuration to build and deploy your applications. But I'm pretty sure you have a different setup in production than in development, right? Your application needs to be tweaked a little bit, like the YAML files, they, meet, they need to be configured a little bit. And usually, you end up writing such, like, such YAML mixed with templating, which is quite nice to read, right? Yeah? You really very quickly understand what it's doing. I mean, YAML file was not enough, so we mixed it with templating, which is quite nice. So now, you have ifs and loops, Quite nice. So basically, basically uh, Helm makes you write such files. So I'm going to show you in one minute uh, that there is another tool you can use, which is Customize. Customize is a template-free uh, solution to customize your YAML files. You don't have to learn a new language. It's just uh, using a very simple mechanism. Let's say you have this base YAML, which is the one you're going to use in, on your development platform, and you want to patch only this value, OK? So you're going to have to write a patch file that contains the path to the value you want to change. You don't have to write the, the empty lines, of course. OK, you remove the empty lines. And customize from the base uh, YAML with the patch YAML will come up with the patch YAML, the patch to YAML, OK? Which is the solution you're going to use in production. OK? So you can have as many patches as, possible as you want. Each patch can be like dedicated to patching a single value or can patch multiple values. And it's quite easy to, to configure. So I'm not going to show you. Yeah, so you can write something like this. Yeah, here. Just going to show you that. So you can say, OK, in production, I'm going to customize the namespace. I'm going to customize the labels. And I'm going to apply a list of patches. And the end result is that if you use scaffold with customize, basically you can say, connect locally to your cluster, dev cluster and do scaffold run. And it's going to use one configuration. We should see that very quickly. Hello world. And then you can point to your production cluster, type the exact same command. And this time, it's going to patch the YAMLs for you. It's going to apply what we call an overlay that's going to patch all the things that need to be patched for production. And it's going to change the message in production, or not, or yes. Yeah, hello, production. Yeah. So if we go into more details, we will see that the pods have new labels. They are running maybe in a different namespace. It's very convenient. And you should really take a look at Customize uh, for two reasons. It's GitOps friendly. So if you put all your configuration in Git, uh, when you deploy your application, it's very easy to do that with Customize. And also, it's integrated uh, in kubectl 114. So time's up. So let's recap uh, if you want to take a snapshot. So basically, we saw Customize to handle the different environments. We saw Canico to build your images securely on any Kubernetes cluster. We saw Jeep to build uh, your applications very quickly. Uh, you don't have to learn or install Docker. We saw DistroLess. Cloud code, if you want, as a developer, to just focus on your code. And of course, scaffold to connect all dots. 
I'm sorry, I, it's time's up. So I don't know if I have like one minute for questions or I don't know, I'm looking at the organizers. Do we have one minute for questions? Couple of minutes, Couple of minutes for questions, sorry. Any questions? Yes. What about Bazel? Yeah, sorry, I removed Bazel at the last minute, but Bazel, you can use it to build any language, and it will give you, give you a very efficient, very incremental build, uh, and you can drive it from scaffold so that your Docker images can be either Docker build or Jib or Bazel, and it's very efficient. The only reason why I don't show Bazel anymore is that it's very complicated to use. Like, you have to forget everything about your previous build tools, and you have to learn Bazel. And lots of the people I talk to are like, yeah, yeah, it looks like it's a good tool. I understand that it's solving a lot of problems at Dropbox or Google, but I don't want to forget everything I know about Maven or Gradle. I don't want to learn Bazel. So I think if you have problems with Maven and Gradle, you should take a look at Bazel. But uh, yeah. Yeah. The base layer of JIP, there was the layer for the JDK, which was the full-fledged JDK. Yeah. Can you use JIP? Yeah, you can use, with JIP, by default, it's going to use a JSRLS, Java 8, or Java 11, but you can use any base image you want, like Adopt JDK, Open JDK, whatever JDK. It can be a JDK, GRE, whatever. You can even put a, another base image and assume it's going to work. Uh, you can change it from the, the, the XML configuration. Yeah. Yes. Does Jib also runs on Kubernetes? Yeah, like chemical. Uh, that's a good question. In fact, it could, it could, because basically you would just have to run a container that grabs the sources and runs Jib. It could work. There's no need for Docker to be installed, so it can you can do that very easily. Uh, you, you should give it a try and share it with other people if it works. But it it will work. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. If you have more questions, you can...